And so everything in green we've seen positive effects with. Uh, before I get into that, though, I do want to have a shout out to uh, Vijay Yadiv. This is a paper that came out recently that I had. Minor would, minor would be an exaggerated role for me on this paper. Minuscules, more like it. But it's really a tour de force paper, and it, it, I think it makes, makes us really think about touring, and that's something we'll be uh, reevaluating in our lab as well. But the data is quite good, so I encourage you to look at that paper. Uh, we've kind of changed how we do lifespan studies in mice, and, and in a sense, we're not doing lifespan studies. We're doing eight-month interventions uh, starting at 18 to 20 months, and then uh, using bio, biomarkers, clocks, uh, uh, frailty, uh, to assess whether we're affecting aging or not. And there are multiple reasons for doing that. Uh, even though lifespan probably is still the best one parameter to measure aging, it takes a long time to get there. And that's not how we're doing human studies. Uh, and so one of the ways I think we can make mice a better model for humans is that we align the approaches we're taking in mice to be more similar to the kinds of clinical studies we're doing in humans, which are typically like six-month interventional studies. Another advantage to this is we can actually harvest the mice before they're found dead in the cage. And so we can do a lot of biochemistry, uh, molecular biology, mechanistic studies to assess what these molecules are doing. Uh, Briefly, want to talk about urolithin A. Uh, this originally came from Johan Ower's lab, and other labs have worked on this. And I want to mention this because this is a robust positive in our lab uh, with a, a one nuance. Uh, so this is a molecule that um, can be ingested and converted to bac by bacteria in the gut to urolithin A. It's very active in a whole range of different tissues, and it had been reported to extend lifespan in worms. Um, and um, and uh, so we, didn't, we haven't done much with that, but we have been able to validate that it extends lifespan in flies, killerfish, and in mice. And so this is the fly data with Nick Tolinsky collaboration. Uh, and I, will point, I should point out that uh, Will Bohr has similar data with urolithin in flies. Um, killerfish data uh, extends lifespan um, over on the right, as does rapamycin in this study, uh, which was a control, but that really hasn't been looked at a whole lot in killerfish yet. Uh, interestingly, uh, it reduced, urolithin reduces mTOR signaling in, in the killerfish as well, and we see that some of that data in mice too. So again, I, I, I wanna come back to the point that a lot of the interventions that are extending lifespan, one of the readouts of it is reduced mTOR signaling. And some of them are very direct, like rapamycin. Some are very indirect. Uh, but I still think that's a pathway that we have to at least consider whenever we're looking at interventions. Um, mouse frailty data, so the frailty is normalized starting at time zero. It goes up in the control animals, and it's suppressed at two different concentrations of urolithin. It even goes down a little bit in the initial uh, two months of the intervention. Uh, if you believe this data. Uh, interestingly, uh, you see a preservation of weight in the mice. The weight tends to drop off at the very end of the lifespan in mice, and that's preserved in urolithin, and a variety of measures of increased strength and muscle function in the mice, which is consistent with, much of this is consistent with preliminary data that's published. And so uh, we're very excited about urolithin, and we're doing mechanistic studies. We think we have a target for it now. Um, there's probably multiple targets. We think we have one of the important ones, and, and we're trying to finalize the con confirming that data. I want to come to Jim Fibrazil, uh, and I also want to point out a couple things about mouse studies. And you've heard this before, but it's worth probably reiterating them also about human studies that it's important to do both males and females. I didn't mention this, but the urolithin effect in our hands is only in the males and the mice. We're repeating that to see if that's really true because it was a relatively small uh, sample size, but the, uh, it seems to be different. Uh, AKG is, in this case, we saw it in the males. We've seen it in the females before. Uh, glycine and gemfibrazil were more uh, stronger effects in the females. I also want to point out the importance of doing two, com two concentrations. In the low concentration, we see 
a pretty significant reduction of frailty by glycine treatment in the females, which is sort of consistent with ITP data. But at high concentrations, it actually reduces frailty in the males. So too often we pick one favorite dose of any intervention in mice, and really we're just rolling the dice when we do that. I, I understand that the there's the cost of fortune and you can't do a whole lot, and, but it's worth considering uh, different dosing strategies. Uh, and the, another point I want to make is that it's great to show that your intervention can alter all the hallmarks and pillars of aging. But what we've learned by now is that interventions that slow aging really affect all of the hallmarks and pillars uh, because they become entrained to each other. And so while that's, those are interesting studies to do, I don't think they're telling us about mechanism particularly. And one of the things that we really want to do is to figure out how to combine interventions together. And so we've decided that we need to get closer to the source to try to solve that problem. And so we're going back now in our studies and making a, a, a really strong effort to get to the actual targets of the drugs. Um, and one of, the, one of the assays we're using is something called SETSA, which is based on a really relatively simple principle that when a drug binds to a protein, it tends to stabilize it. And so if you raise the temperature of the extract in the presence of the drug, the drug will bind the protein and keep it soluble, keep it from aggregating, and you can see that on a Western blot. And so that's how we got to a putative target with urolithin, and I'll tell you a little bit about our studies with gemfibrozil. Um, gemfibrozil reduces frailty in the mice as well and extends lifespan in uh, yeast and worms. I'm not gonna show all of that old data. This is an old drug, though. Uh, some of the key data was from the 70s where it was shown that it lowers triglyceride levels and increases uh, HDL. So this is considered a fibrate. Uh, it's still prescribed and sold by seven different companies even though it's off patent. Uh, it has better side effect profiles than other fibrates, at least according to some clin the clinicians I like. <laughs> uh, and um, we got really interested in what it was doing. Uh, and so the mechanism supposedly is that it gets into the cell, binds to this complex containing PPAR alpha and repressors, dissociates it and allows the transcription factor to go into the nucleus and regulate lipid metabolism. And I have to say that we have beaten ourselves to death to try to validate that mechanism. And I'm at this point relatively convinced that gemfibrozil is not a PPAR alpha activator. Uh, and also, certainly, that it's not the longevity effects are not going through that. So I'm going to tell you what we think it really is doing. I will say that if you look hard enough in the literature, you would probably may come to that conclusion anyway, because the binding constant in the literature is 300 millimolar, um, which is not an achievable level in cells. So um, it's not just our data. So this is an old drug, so let's figure out what it's doing. And so when we did the SETSA, it combined with some of the other in vivo data and model organisms, we came across a binding partner called PEPT1. Uh, PEPT1 is a transporter in, uh, in the intestine uh, that takes up amino acids. And you can see that in the presence of the drug, you get stabilization of the protein um, and uh, it does not aggregate. So PEPT1 was identified a while back uh, and it's a non-specific transporter of dipeptides and tripeptides. So it's, it's really elegant to think of the idea that you have 20 different transporters for each amino acid. Um, but in reality, the vast majority of amino acids come in through this dirty mix of dipeptides and tripeptides that uh, come from the digestion in the gut. Maybe 70% of your amino acids come from a receptor like this. And so... Uh, I can show you just the mouse data to convince you maybe that gemfibrozil is affecting this. So uh, this transporter is expressed in the small intestine. So we can take out the small intestine, tie it off, and put in uh, fluorescent dipeptides, uh, and then look at uptake of the fluorescent dipeptides across the jejunum, I think. Uh, and when you do that, what you find is that gemfibrozil at two different concentrations blocks uptake of amino acids. Uh, and maybe more importantly, two weeks of treatment with this drug will reduce by about 10 to 15 percent the essential amino acids that are present in muscle. Uh, now we know that amino acid restriction can extend lifespan, uh, 
Uh, and uh, there's a lot of excitement over eating uh, fats and proteins these days, but most of the animal model data suggests that if you keep animals isocaloric, it's actually high carb, low protein diets that lead to longer lifespan. And so we think one of the things Jim Fibrizel is doing is mimicking uh, reduced amino acid uptake. And if you have less amino acids, you should have less mTOR signaling. And we can show pretty clearly that that's the case. This is a cell culture experiment where we took cells and starved them. And we're looking at phosphorylation of S6 kinase. When we add amino acids, you get induction of mTOR, single amino acids, and Jim Pribazil doesn't block that. If you add leucine, the same thing. But if you add dipeptides and force the cells to use that to activate TOR, then Jim Fibrazil inhibits activation of mTOR. And so if I put all this t data together, I'm not showing you everything for the sake of time, we think that this is an example of how it's possible to make old drugs young again. So we have a drug that's widely used, it, it's, but the target we think is wrong. It's not PPAR alpha. PEPT1 is one of the targets. There's two other targets in lipid metabolism that we're working on. Uh, and so now what we can do when we have the real targets, because we have better technology now than we did in the 70s and 80s, we can go back and make derivatives and make much better drugs that are actually going after the real targets that they're hitting. And so uh, this is, we don't, we're not viewing this as a repurposing strategy, although we are starting a company. Our goal is to make new chemical entities uh, that are better than the originals because of the knowledge we have. But when you think about that, how many old drugs have unknown targets or the wrong targets? I mean, metformin, still debated after all these years. I think 10 to 20% of the protein or the drugs that are out there on the market, we don't really know what they're doing. And so in talking to Owen Phillips, one of the things we're trying to do now is to use AI but unlike other companies that are trying to find signals and repurpose drugs in new pathways, which is cool and interesting, by the way, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to use AI to find noise because noise is indicative of drugs that are, we don't know the targets for. And so we think that we can come up with a list of drugs that uh, have this potential relatively rapidly with new technologies, find the real targets, and each one of those then is a um, lead uh, uh, approach to find new, new drug platforms. Uh, we want to keep that focused on longevity. I'm not running away from longevity, uh, so don't worry. <laughs> um, I want to turn to biomarkers and I want to talk about the work of Max uh, Unfried. Does anybody in the room not know Max? Is that... Is that... <laughs> yeah, okay. Everybody knows you, Max. So... Um, the, uh, and and he did, he's been making lipid clocks. And the reason we like lipids, uh, and you might hear this from Kristen about uh, proteins as well, is that we believe that any complex data set, uh, probably, you can make an aging clock from if you have enough people uh, in the right kinds of data. Uh, but lipids and proteins are much closer to function. <laughs> these, are the, these are the molecules in the cell that are actually doing things. And so... While methylation clocks are fascinating, and we use those, and I'm, I'm amazed at the progress that's been made by many people in that area, uh, we've been going back and trying to make lipid clocks because once we identify lipids, they're active in reactions, and we can try to link that back to aging and mechanistically. And so, actually, Max has made a few of these clocks now, but I want to tell you about this one that's unpublished because he did the opposite of what you normally do. What he did is he made a clock from serum of people with pancreatic cancer to look at aging. And so typically when you're making these clocks, you try to make clocks from normal populations or uh, people without disease because the worry is that the disease is going to impact uh, how you measure aging. But it looks like uh, this, this worked. I'm just going to show you a couple slides and then you can find Max if you have more questions. So we chose, there were 220 healthy people, but the clock was actually made from 500 people with uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, and we used uh, 148 lipids for this, and we only used lipids that were identified. So this is a lipidomic study, but when you do that, a lot of the peaks you get, you can't tell what lipid it is. And the whole point of this is to get to function. So we only started with the lipids that it was clear what they were. And that comes from this paper down at the bottom. 
And it's trained in mortality, but these are cancer patients. This is a very severe disease. Five-year survival is about 6%. And it, it works very well in that regard. So if you take the people that look the youngest uh, in this clock, they have a very good survival, up to 200 months. And the people that look the oldest have a very short survival. In a way, that's not that surprising because you would, it was trained in that way. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that you can go back and look at the normal population. And what you find is that even though you train this from the cancer patients, the healthy population scores fairly well. And they're about eight years younger than the cancer patients. So this is working backwards from normal. Normally, you start with a normal population and then show the people with some disease or biologically older. It's not true with every other group. If we looked with the pancreatitis patients, they were still older than the control group. So I'm bringing this up because especially when you're looking at something like lipidomics or proteomics, there are not a lot of huge data sets out there, especially in normal populations. Most of the data sets are in disease populations. And so I think that these data sets are actually still interesting to tell us something about aging, even though we're working in pathogenic cases. And it's probably possible to regress apart the, the disease-specific parameters and the aging-specific parameters. Um, you can actually identify key lipids that drive the prediction of the clock, ceramides, sphingolipids, um, and many of them, as you can see the, the, uh, um, the risk scores here, many of them are already associated with aging. And so one of the great things about this approach is that it sort of internally feels right because the key lipids you're pulling out of this unbiased AI analysis are lipids that we know are associated with aging. So it's kind of hopefully closing the loop between all of this long work on the aging and identifying things using older methods and, and using the AI. It's almost confirmatory. And we have a similar uh, result um, from another clock. This is uh, lipids in the, uh, from postmortem uh, uh, brain samples. And uh, Jaquim in the lab worked on this. Uh, and in this case, we made the clock from the normal uh, uh, patients. These are car accident victims and, and other unfortunate situations. Uh, and you get a very good clock with lipids in the brain here. You can also show that people with autism had an accelerated age. People with schizophrenia had an accelerated age. And particularly people with Down syndrome did, although we had a very small number of samples there. But the interesting thing about this is even though the clock generated hundreds of lipids, we could get about 95% of the predictivity of that with just five dollar calls. Um, and so that's showing that, uh, again, we've hit molecules that have already been linked to aging in the brain. Uh, and it's uh, predicting what's going on. So uh, I want to go on and talk a little bit about uh, AKG. I'm just going to show two slides. Uh, this is something we've worked on for a long time uh, and with a company called PDL Health uh, to try to identify combinations of natural products that affect longevity. Uh, and we have a, a lot of mouse data, including a lot that's unpublished. We think we're beginning to understand the mechanism of action with regard to aging. Um, but I want to use uh, human data just to make a point that uh, is, is not being discussed a whole lot yet. And that's, this is uh, people that use the product for an average of seven months, not a placebo-controlled study. And what we found is, in general, using a relatively simple biologic age methylation test, that individuals got about six years younger after seven months on the treatment. Um, now, there was no placebo, and I do believe there's a placebo effect on biologic age. If you're spending $100 a month to try to be younger, you're probably a little bit younger. Um, not, but this was a big effect, so hopefully it's a combination of the product and the placebo. Uh, but the, the more important point I want to make is that we saw a very uh, clear uh, relationship in who responded uh, to, to this particular intervention. And it was people that were chronologically older and also people that were biologically older than their chronologic age. And so in other words, people that are not aging particularly well are the ones that seem to respond in this intervention. And I, and I bring this up because, you know, as we go forward and start testing human interventions more, I think we're going to find a lot of uh, personalization happening. Some people will respond to some interventions, some people to others. It may be sex dependent. It may be the current state of their aging dependent. It may be how they're aging. And we really need to not just test interventions, but ultimately understand which interventions are going to work in which people.